concluding remarks <laughs> to uh, be given by Karen Newman, who is the Owen Walker Class of 33 Professor of Humanities and Professor of Comparative Literature and English here at Brown. She's also a past director of the Pembroke Center and also a donor of her papers. So please, Karen. So um, I said it's very hard to think about the after when you haven't yet heard the before. And today has been so rich, so the panels and so very interesting, our conversations, and have prompted um, uh, lots of uh, thoughts that I hope I can share a little bit with you here. Um, they've certainly taught us a lot about the holdings of the center, maybe not as much about um, I mean, I think the original uh, prompting for the archive um, had to do with the merger and wanting to preserve um, the history of Pembroke College and its um, uh, graduates. And I think um, all of the things we've heard about today grew very much out of that um, desire that came about at the time of the merger. Um, we've learned a lot about from both of the panels about the sorts of things to be found in archives um, and also um, the uses to which they've been put certainly and I was thinking also about this question that has come back several times that is is the archive the materials the papers of ordinary people worthwhile and I was thinking about it today in terms of um, I've donated my papers, and so far I've only given all of the papers from when I was director of the Pembroke Center, and also when I was head of the, and a member of the Affirmative Action Monitoring Committee that was very involved with um, the um, execution, if you will, of the consent decree in the Louise Lamphere case. And, um, I could easily have jettisoned that material when I was finally finished with it and the consent decree had been vacated and so forth. Um, and I didn't, but gave it. And you'll see downstairs there's a letter that I wrote to the chair of the then economics department in which I had to explain to him that Europeans were not minorities. <laughs> um, I was also very struck, um, both as we all were by Anne's story, um, my, all of my papers are not going to be at the, um, um, in the Pitt Themis Theory archives because I have a few things from my days when I was a PhD student at Berkeley um, when the very first um, women's studies class that was being, um, offered by the Department of Comparative Literature was offered not because the department or the administration had decided that the kind of work we were doing was interesting and that it might be important for um, us to study writing by uh, women or any of those questions, but rather it was in relation to a kind of social movement, the Women's Caucus, which was the equivalent then of Brown Women United. And we voted amongst ourselves, vetting one another's syllabi, who would be the one to offer a particular course. And so I rummaged through my materials and turned out that I had materials from when I first taught that course that the female protagonist in the 19th century novel, it was called, and I came here and then taught it um, in different forms, twice with Naomi Shore. So um, I've been thinking about these questions and the way in which archives bridge and, and move in different directions. Um, they've certainly come archives to occupy a privileged place in literary and historical studies. You might say we've come down with what Derrida called, Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher, um, mal d'archive, that is, a uh, wittily translated archive fever. And it's sometimes assumed that archives are important, namely for scholars working in earlier historical periods. And I should say 
I'm the only person here, except for Jean, who works in an earlier period. Everyone working in these archives is working on 20th century um, uh, figures or 21st century figures, in fact. Um, and it used to be that it was scholars working in medieval or early modern or 18th century. But today's conference certainly demonstrates the role archives have come to play in many different fields and periods, which as a scholar working in an early field, I appreciate very much. Um, and so the expansiveness really of what constitutes an archive, I think is very important to our conversation today. Um, they're not only papers preserved from the past, but also collections as we've learned of material culture, the Jamaican Barbie, I was at that round table, um, virtual or hacker archives, the Wayback Machine that archives digital content like blogs or your favorite recipe, um, film archives and so forth. And of course here at Brown, we also have many interesting archives outside of um, the Pembroke archives that we're talking about today. Um, the important inventories and documents um, on the slave trade and at, on slavery at the John Carter Brown Library, the wonderful magic collection at the John Hay, and also the Hay has a wonderful collection of midi medical and obstetrical materials, among many others. So we use archives as evidence to prove claims and arguments and in, that's increasingly important today, certainly when we're bombarded with so-called alternative facts. But as Natalie Zeman Davis long ago observed in her book, Fiction in the Archives, archives offer facts, but facts that are interpreted, fought over, debated. And we haven't talked as much about that, though I think of that as sort of a classic position in relation, certainly, to archives. That is. Um, they do not speak for themselves, right? And in fact, we've been having speakers speak for them um, throughout the day. Um, Davis then famously reminded us that um, when, as we are experiencing everything, we're experiencing in every news cycle, um, and that's what's happening to us today with real events are really always events as recounted by others. That's Davis's um, 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 words or phrase. So in Derrida's resonant phrase, the archive is the prosthesis of memory. So historians, and indeed arguably our whole culture, we might say, has turned to data, especially big data, um, big and small, to counting. It's why the Brown History Department is a social science and not amongst the humanities, um, because it aspires to a scienticity, if you will, presumably more highly valued than the fuzzy humanities. In short, what we find in archives must be interpreted, read, as we say, in literary studies. So I want to close today with um, proceed, today's proceedings, and I'll be brief so we can get to the wine, <laughs> um, with two small examples from my own work. Um, and uh, several years ago, I got into a rather vicious, um, actually not from my point of view, but certainly from his, debate with a social historian of early modern London about archives that was prompted by a book I had published entitled Cultural Capitals, Early Modern London and Paris. One chapter called Sex in the City looked at the phenomenon of prostitution in early modern London by way of a rather amusing pornographic poem called A Choice of Valentines by Thomas Nash, a contemporary of Shakespeare. The poem recounts the story of a young man who follows his girl to the city, where he finds her in a brothel, pays to have sex with her, ejaculates prematurely, thus prompting her to employ a dildo to finish the job. 
As part of the research I did in working on the poem, I consulted an important archive of early modern London called, known as the Bridewell Court Books. We have them from 1559 to 1642. That gives you some idea of how far back I'm working. <laughs> and then there is a hiatus. And actually, that reminds me, Carol Steedman's book that Marianne uh, mentioned this morning, one of the things she reminds us of in talking about the materiality of archives is that the leather that binds old books carries with it um, the um, uh, bacteria and, I mean, you know, that it really does have material that we would worry about breathing and experiencing as well. But anyway, that's a, a side, an aside. So I was consulting these Bridewell court books, oh, anthrax, in fact, anthrax, in fact. So we have them, as I said, from 1559 to 1642. Then there's a hiatus, and then we, they resume into the modern period, that is, through the 19th century. Now, Bridewell was a prison, and the court books record the depositions of prostitutes, bawds, and pimps who were involved in various illicit activities. Now, the historian whose work I challenged used them to produce facts and numbers about prostitutes, how much, where, who, etc. My um, interlocutor believed that he could trace in the archives women's own voices, their real voices, what he terms, and this is a quotation, their own narratives. And he made larger claims as well, claims intended to impugn literary materials. He claimed that in reading depositions, we are perhaps, and I quote, closer to the authentic voice of the bawd and prostitute than we are in fictive works, literary works, such as the Nash poem that I was working on and was the subject of my chapter. Pamphlet, ballad, and play, he claimed, must, quote, adopt a supporting role to the court book. But the Bridewell court books are judicial. They are concerned with law and punishment. The women deposed are responding to authorities who usually want to imprison them and usually did. When I read the Bridewell court books, I was struck not with a sense of the personal narratives they recounted, not with women's authentic voices, but with their formulaic character and the double sense of the word character both the many hands, as in handwriting of the scribes transcribing testimony, and of the mannerisms, rhetoric, and diction of those scribes. It seemed to me these depositions revealed very little of the authentic voice, and also very little about questions that were important to me and that have come up several times today in our discussion questions of affect, of feeling and emotion, of dress, of motivation, of desire, of performance, and motive itself. These seem to me virtually, um, there seemed to be virtually no attention paid to how the interlocutor, the authority asking the questions, produced certain responses and not others. And that's certainly an issue we've talked about and has come up as well today. Um, so um, my second example relates, well, just to finish up then, so produce some responses and not others. In short, archives require us to read and interpret. They do not spare us from hermeneutic obligation. Right, the obligation to read and interpret and understand. So my second example relates to the question that we've also talked about around digitalization. Um, in fact, um, whether we need archives at all. And several people have mentioned how 
um, you know, that most of us just work in the digital archives, and, um, but also about the excitement of working with the materials themselves. Um, and sometimes I'm asked to write a letter to, uh, on behalf of um, the uh, attempts by libraries, in fact, to uh, preserve documents rather than simply digitize them. So I think it's very important that we preserve these material documents and things themselves. Um, so these repositories, letters, drawings, books. So my second example relates to the, this question of whether or not we need to preserve um, the documents themselves or just digitalize them. Um, Jacques Concierge, who's a French historian, has a wonderful term, he calls it paperas, which in French is translated, it sort of means sort of paperwork, bureaucratic junk, just the, the kind of piles of paper um, and, and so forth that can overwhelm, right? So this paperwork, the paperwork, why not just digitize, thus making available to so many more um, online, right? And I'm totally for that. I mean, it's changed my life to be able to use early, early English books online and many other kinds of archives. So I think it's absolutely fabulous uh, and truly fabulous in the sense that you can barely believe you can get to these things. But it is also important to consult the materials themselves from, um, because digitalization, of course, allows us to consult things from across the globe, um, and there, but there's still nothing quite like working in an archive. And I want to give an example. When I was working on um, a, another book of mine called Fetal Positions, um, which was concerned with the abortion debates that sought to, and in that book I was really seeking to historicize and refute claims made by many commentators, including feminist commentators, that the representation of the fetus as an independent, autonomous being and the concomitant putative erasure of the mother was a late 20th century phenomenon. That's claimed by lots and lots of people. It's claimed by, um, in many different places and ways. And I worked in a lot, and many people have claimed that, in fact, this was a kind of product of contemporary right-wing opposition to abortion. So I worked in many archives looking at a long trajectory of medical illustration from the early second century um, Greek. And so this, I'm going to show you some. I hope this is going to work, since I can't actually see. Okay, um, so I worked on these, uh, this tradition of medical illustration from the early second century Greek physician Serranus, uh, preserved in a 13th century manuscript in the Bibliothèque Nationale, I'll get to talking about the slide in a minute, to the Life magazine photographs of uh, the recently deceased Leonard Nielsen for Life magazine that some of you may know. In these images, the uterus is often represented, as you can see here, in the shape of a jar, the woman as fabled vessel, and the fetal figures are stylized, conventional, unrealistic little homunculi, <laughs> little men, sometimes stick-like, sometimes pudgy, represented in fantastic gymnastic postures. So having seen a Bibliothèque Nationale catalog reproducing this 13th century manuscript based on the early Greek physician Serranus' images, sounds very learned, doesn't it? Um, I was taken aback to note that the fetuses, which are always male, 
had erections. This is another example. Um, you can imagine the interpretive temptation to a feminist writing about such images. But as a dutiful scholar, I thought I'd better go have a look. And what I discovered was that these disproportionate erect penises reproduced in the exposition catalog from the Bibliothèque Nationale on medical illustration, in fact, were 20th century schoolboy doodles <laughs> that the Bay Inn had reproduced without comment in the catalog. <laughs> Probably because whoever wrote them, the catalog copy, wasn't the same person who reproduced the images. And when it's reproduced, it's much harder to read. It was just some technician, not a scholar. Now, it's interesting too, this is not um, a reproduction from the catalog, but this is an actual reproduction of the manuscript. And when I took it up and said, these are original, now they tried to clean them off. So they were, in fact, much more line drawings in the way in which the rest of the line drawings are done in the uh, uh, original, but they have tried to clean it off, and that's why the serpent is <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it? Um, so when I'm asked about preserving the material artifacts of archives, I lobby hard for preservation, <laughs> which is why I'm pleased to be here today celebrating the Pembroke archives that have already prompted such interesting work and that will prompt new work and produce um, new knowledge. Uh, Peter called it earlier reclamation, the work of reclamation, and I, I like that very much, but also productive discord. Um, and. Uh, knowledge far into the future, and again, in Joanna's words, produce thinkers, because that's what we need. Thank you. So, I'm happy to, if there are questions, I know it's been a long day in the Golden City. We can definitely So, John, has a question. Can you, can you tell us a little more about how this document was altered and what no. role did the archivist? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so where's the role? Yeah, some, this process. Someone in the library was, and who knows who it was, whether it was somebody working in the library, or the scholar somebody working in the library, is, uh, who, you know, uh, uh, processes materials, no, you know, just the way you see doodles and all the time. It's just graffiti. Um, and, but it got reproduced in the catalogs, uh, presumably. <laughs> It was also in the, uh, as an original um, image in this show from which the catalog was taken. And that's how I came to the materials. And I saw the catalog from the show. Um, but I just, something about it wasn't quite right. <laughs>
um, sorry, and certainly interesting for um, the whole question of digitalization because it's very tempting. I mean, it. I mean, I think it was Mary who said earlier that um, you know, as we try to raise money for bricks and mortar, we need just as much money um, for digitalization and the preservation of um, material. And it's absolutely true because to um, figure out ways in which to um, uh, preserve things and also trace their histories. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to me the same argument can be made for preserving the oral histories as opposed to their transcripts. Mm -hmm. Whether the oral histories yeah. Absolutely. I, I think you're right, and I, I mean, I think that's what Michelle was getting at too, is that the, there is a, I mean, those questions, exactly, those are the questions I um, had to ask and wanted to ask myself in looking at all the, just the written transcript of the Bridewell court books, but also they were determined by the kinds of questions that the uh, judicial authorities were asking. And so I completely agree, I mean, I think that those questions of affect and feeling and dress and performance and motive that um, you, that are part of what you um, uh, receive and must interpret when you uh, see an oral history. Or, um, unfortunately for our field, it's not possible. <laughs> just not possible. Yes, Suzanne. So um, this is just to follow up on your story about uh, literature and facts. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I also do work in archives, and I don't go f as far back as you. I only go to the 19th century. But um, a, a very similar example I encountered in when I was working on infant uh, women who had committed infanticide in, in, in the 1880s in Bologna. And, um, and so all sorts of things had been said about these women and their motives and their character based on the reading of court records. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a group of feminist historians in, working in Bologna then started going back and looking at the pretrial records and found that uh, these women were being very carefully trained and rehearsed to make the kinds of statements that they then end up making in, in court. So you have this total reversal. So you have what was being read as factual documents, in fact, being the greatest fiction. Mm -hmm. right? And so, I mean, it's very important precisely oh, to look at a much broader situation. Absolutely. The whole sort of moralistic component and sort of you want to uh, present yourself as sorry for what you've done because then you might mitigate the sentence. Well, it was honor. Received. That's right. Exactly. They had to speak that they were doing it out of honor. Exactly. Right? But they had never heard the word honor before they got <laughs> into the court. Right? That's great. That's a great example. Yeah, maybe it's time for a glass of wine. <laughs>